so happy to be here with Dr. Knight. Uh, Dr. Knight, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing well. Thank you so much, Janine. Very happy to be here with you as well. So I wanted to start really broad, and I'm hoping you can just uh, introduce us basically to the Division of Global Health Protection. Tell me a bit about what role the division plays in pandemics like this one and what it's doing you know, when there's not a pandemic. Thank you. Uh, so the Division of Global Health Protection is in CDC's Center for Global Health, and we work uh, across the agency and across the world with uh, organizations and with countries on helping them to be able to prepare for outbreaks and public health threats. So what that really means is helping them to look at their public health systems, those systems that help them to be able to prevent, detect, and respond to outbreaks. We help them to identify gaps in those public health systems and the concrete solutions to fix and address those gaps. And then we partner with them on putting those solutions in place. Can, um, you know, it's been, well, before we even get into the, the, the timeline, um, tell us about uh, some of the things that you're learning from specific countries or, or you know, the countries that you feel like um, have made a lot of progress or the ones that you're most worried about. Can you sort of give us the lay of the land? So to speak? Sure, as it relates to the, the current COVID pandemic, as of today, we have nearly 6.3 million cases that are being reported globally and about 380,000 deaths globally. So clearly this pandemic is impacting everyone around the world. All countries around the world are being affected. At CDC, as I mentioned, the partnerships and the work that we do in countries and together with countries is a very important part of our response uh, to COVID as well. We have a long history of working with countries and um, helping them to develop these systems to prepare for and respond to outbreaks. Really, when it gets down to it, this really means the people. The people that we have within CDC uh, that are part of this response, as well as the people that are in our host country governments um, and governmental partners. So maybe I'll touch a little bit on, on those people and some of the key things that they're doing. Um, at headquarters, we have staff that have been mobilized from across the agency to be part of the, not, not only the domestic response, but also the global response to COVID-19. This all falls within our agency's Emergency Operations Center, which was activated back in January, early on in the outbreak. In addition to that, we also have country offices, CDC country offices, that are in more than 50 countries around the world. And we have CDC staff, both American staff, as well as local experts that are our staff, who are working there, sitting together with other partners, uh, with WHO, with other international partners, other US government agencies like USAID, and ministries of health to help to respond to on the ground what's happening in those countries related to the pandemic. One of the key components of the global health security work that we've been doing is helping to build expertise across countries for what we call field epidemiology. That's kind of a long word, a long term for disease detectives. These are the people who are the boots on the ground who are going out and investigating the uh, cases of COVID and in other outbreaks, the cases of those diseases that are occurring. Over the last 40 years, CDC's field epidemiology training programs have trained more than 18,000 people around the world in other countries. Most of those, more than 80% of those people, continue to work in their home countries and the majority of them in their host country government, so in their ministries of health and other ministries. So having these graduates with this disease detective expertise in place at a time like COVID is really, really important. Um, a couple of examples that I could give, for example, um, in Haiti, uh, we've trained almost 500 Ministry of Health personnel as part of this field epidemiology training program. We also help to establish a national epidemiology surveillance network. So this is a system for reporting of cases. And that system covers 
more than 670 health facilities in the country. Another good example is from Pakistan. We started the field epidemiology training program in Pakistan in 2010, together with their National Institute of Health, which is our sister agency there. And that has trained more than 545 disease detectives. In the current outbreak, those disease detectives are leading Pakistan's uh, investigation and response activities at the federal level, as well as at the provincial level. They've helped to develop customized training programs for COVID-19, for example, for the screening teams that have been deployed to their points of entry, that's their airports, their land, and their sea um, uh, entry points in Pakistan. They've also trained field staff, so um, the individuals that have to go out and collect uh, specimens from suspected cases and how to transport those specimens appropriately. And then they serve as liaisons as well between those field teams and the national laboratories that those specimens are being sent to. I see. So what have we learned from COVID? It's been six months since the virus kind of made the leap into humans and began circulating the planet. What have we learned about how those systems are and aren't working? Um, you know, where the vulnerabilities are, where the strengths are, what is it revealing to us? In this COVID-19 outbreak, we've learned a lot about the strengths as well as the gaps in public health systems across a number of countries. There's still a lot to learn though, and it's because of these partnerships and these relationships that we have that we're able to continue that learning and continue to apply the lessons that we've learned uh, on a regular basis. So let me give a couple of examples around that. Um, within the CDC's Emergency Operations Center, that is the structure that we have for management of our response, both domestically as well as internationally. We have an international task force that international task force is comprised of some of my staff from Division of Global Health Protection, but also experts from across the agency on global preparedness and response. The international task force um, works across with other countries to look at the, the data around the outbreaks in countries on a daily basis. So we are able to track um, the, the cases that are being reported, and also through our partnerships, learning about the mitigation measures that countries put in place, and as their outbreaks improve, learning about how they're lifting their mitigation me measures, that allows us to look at and overlay all of those data elements. So we're able to look at those case counts that are occurring, uh, the deaths that are occurring, and the overlay of the public health measures, of the social distancing, of the closures of, of businesses and community activities, of the closures of schools, and what's the impact of all of those on an outbreak. And then now as places are starting to reopen, the next focus that we have is looking at what's the impact as those layers are gradually peeled off. And working together with our public health counterparts in those countries to share lessons learned. So if one country is ahead of others, on placing mitigation measures or on, on lifting mitigation measures, what are things that we can learn from that country to then be able to share with others that we're working with. And so from all of those lessons, are there policies or procedures that you're looking at changing or adapting or modifying in response to, to what you've learned so far? There are definitely procedures um, that are, are, are looked at and, um, and adapted. Uh, so, for example, I talked about those disease detectives, the field epidemiology uh, training program graduates. Um, here domestically, we also have our disease detectives, our epidemiologists that are working um, in states and, and with local health departments on, the, on their outbreaks domestically. One aspect of the, the guidance for the disease detectives is um, how do they best con uh, conduct the contact tracing that's going out and looking for those individuals who have come in contact with uh, people who have, have diagnosed uh, COVID or who have had symptoms of COVID. 
and that's a, 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 a collection of tools and guidance materials that um, that we've developed and we look at as we learn more about the virus um, how do we need to change those so that those people on the ground those disease detectives have the right information to guide them on um, on, on the identification of contacts um the CDC has weathered a lot of criticism uh, in the U.S. in recent months for a number of different things. And, you know, as I've said, I think reasonable people can disagree about what's fair versus not fair. But, you know, when we look at the global context, and I think that often gets lost in the dialogue in the U.S., are there lessons that the United States can learn from other countries that, that the CDC is working with? There are definitely lessons that we can all learn from one another. There are things that other countries can learn from what we are doing domestically in the United States in regard to our outbreak. And there are lessons that we can learn from other countries in how they uh, are addressing their outbreaks as well. This really comes down to the international cooperation that has to take place at a variety of levels, at a global level across uh, all countries, at a regional level, as you're looking at countries that border upon one another or have a lot of, of transit between countries, as well as um, within a country. How do we as international partners work with others um, in countries where we are sitting and where we are helping them? Um, we partner with a number of organizations, with multilateral organizations, academic institutions, private sector companies, non-governmental organizations, and uh, community groups, as well as government institutions, primarily ministries of health, but other ministries are also very critical in a response in a country. I'll talk a little bit about um, the global health security agenda, which is a framework that countries around the world participate in. This was established in 2014. And uh, it was launched as a way to bring all of these partners together that I just mentioned to help make the world safer from infectious disease, disease threats. And to do that in a way that spoke to really concrete commitments to addressing specific public health gaps. The US government is a part of that Global Health Security Agenda or GHSA. Um, and CDC is um, one of the agencies that's actively engaged in that. We focused our investments in a number of countries in order to help to improve their public health systems, like I mentioned earlier, um, that helped to lay that foundation for the effective and rapid detection and response um, in order to prepare for outbreaks. Um, I could talk to maybe uh, an example of a couple of, of countries and some of those activities that we've done with our host country partners through the global pause? health security. I want to pause for just one second and actually backtrack because I think the concept of global health security is confusing to people who are not immersed in public health. Can you talk a little bit about what that means specifically? Mm -hmm. um, global health security means the ability of a country and across all of the countries, the ability of the world to be able to effectively prevent, detect, and respond to outbreaks. Now, when you drill that down, it really is at a, at a country level, it's a whole of government response. We generally think of outbreaks as being the responsibility of the, the Ministry of Health uh, or you know, Department of Health and Human Services here domestically. Um, but we know that it's, it's not just public health and the COVID outbreak is, is showing us that around the world. An outbreak uh, requires the public health experts and the healthcare experts, those frontline healthcare workers but it also requires other components of government. COVID-19, we know, is uh, in a family of viruses that's, um, that we've seen in animal populations. So it requires the intersection with agricultural um, uh, ministries as well in governments. When we're looking at preparation for outbreaks, there are many other diseases that um, can move from an animal population to a human population. Ebola is another one 
that we've been dealing with over these last few years um, and can cause significant um, illness and death in the human population. So incorporation of not only ministries of health, but ministries of agriculture, uh, incorporation of ministries of finance, because when you're talking about sustainable systems, there have to be resources to, to, to fund and to maintain the development uh, and utilization of those systems and to be able to pay for having the experts who work within the public health sector um, to, to understand the information and address the outbreaks as they're occurring. So global health security and the global health security agenda was really a, um, a whole of government and a whole of society approach to looking at the roles and responsibilities of, of different um, organizations and different parts of government and how to bring those together in a systematic way, a way that helps to identify gaps um, objectively and then lays out the plans and the solutions for those gaps. Um, what are your top priorities right now as director of the division and pushing through this first wave of coronavirus and, and bracing for a potential second or third wave in the fall? Uh, what are the things that you're most focused on? What are the things that you're most worried about? Our top priorities are to really understand and address the illness and the death that's caused by COVID-19. We do that through these systems that uh, we have helped to put in place and looking at the data and the information that we get from those systems. But we have to recognize, we have to understand that that, that data um, is, that's people. Those are individuals. When we're talking about cases, when we're talking about um, the learning on um, which populations are most significantly affected, when we talk about the people who are most at risk, um, the people who are elderly, the people have, who have certain underlying medical conditions, when we talk about the settings in which mitigation measures are potentially difficult to implement, very um, high density settings in many of the countries that we're working with um, that are, are steeped with poverty. We have to think about ultimately our goal of impacting the, the illness and the death and being able to um, help countries to decrease that impact on their population. So we do that through all of these systems, um, but in a way that, that keeps that end goal of helping those individuals in mind. That, that brings me back to kind of the question we discussed earlier, which is, you know, what can the U.S. learn from some other countries? And again, you know, there's a lot to be done with uh, data infrastructure in the U.S., and there's a lot of room for improvement there, as we all know. Um, what are other countries doing to monitor and to accrue that data that we might learn from? Are there things that other countries are doing that's kind of better than what we've got here, or? Uh, we, each country has its own data system. Um, and that is one of those aspects that we have worked with countries on for a number of years now, is looking at their data systems um, and how to help them to effectively build and maintain data systems. Um, one example that, um, that I can think of uh, as it relates to data systems is um, what we've done in Sierra Leone. So Sierra Leone, we, um, we started having a much more intensive focus on working with the Sierra Leone government uh, during the 2014 um, Ebola outbreak, and we've continued that partnership. One of the things that we learned was that their uh, data collection system um, was, had many gaps. It was paper-based. Um, there were a lot of challenges in, um, in moving the data which as we talked about, that data really reflects individuals who have a certain illness. So in moving that data from a local level, so a community um, health clinic, a, a district level, up to the national level. And over the years, we have worked with them on a couple of different aspects of that. One is helping to train people um, at those different levels on um, the, the the importance of reporting on certain illnesses and, um, 
and ensuring that the government has that information to be able to then respond to in a timely manner. So training the people, helping them to understand the information that they're collecting and why, why is it important? The other aspect is the system itself. And so we've helped them to put in place an electronic system and move away from the paper-based system, one that doesn't rely on a constant um, you know, internet connectivity that, that can be uploaded um, when the connection is there. And then the action that occurs once that information has been um, submitted. So once a district has reported on a potential cluster, then what do you do? How do you act upon it? Uh, and ensure that someone addresses that to determine is there an outbreak or isn't there. So that's one um, very strong partnership uh, that, that we've helped to be a part of and has helped Sierra Leone to have a much more effective um, system on recognizing or detecting when um, illnesses are occurring, specifically priority diseases and determining whether there is an outbreak that needs to be addressed. And then I think this is probably one of my last questions, but uh, one of the things that comes up a lot is how underfunded just global health agencies in general are, not just the CDC, but all of them. What are the resources, like if I gave you a magic wand and you could have whatever you needed for your division, what are the things that you would, you would want to have that you don't necessarily have now? Like do you have a wish list basically, I guess is my question. I think everybody has a wish list. Um, I think part of my job as the director for Division of Global Health Protection is to not only have that wish list, but also to, um, to look at how we prioritize. Um, because uh, even if I had all of the money in the world, um, we still have to be able to have the capacity and the ability to utilize all of that money effectively. What you've raised in terms of um, resources, I think to me, really speaks to one of the challenges that we've seen in public health, and that is this cycle of panic and neglect. Yeah. We've seen that with other outbreaks. I know you've, uh, you've written about that yourself. <laughs> neglect, panic, repeat, because it's what we all say and it's what we all see over and over again, so yeah. That's right, that's right, and, um, and I think, for me, that would be one of the things at the top of my wish list, which is um, how do we break that cycle? How do we break that cycle of um, having a, a significant outbreak that causes a lot of panic and a, an appropriate large response, but then as that outbreak ends or as we shift to other things, then we hit the neglect phase. Um, and, and that's where I think we need to have that break and we need to look at um, what's a more sustainable um, process for public health, for public health globally, so that we can ensure that, um, that as we build these systems, as we help to create capacity, that that's maintained and continues to move forward. Okay, this will be my last question. And I always think of more. <laughs> um, <laughs> What do you want policymakers and average American citizens to know about your work and about your division that they don't necessarily know? What are the things you wish people understood when they were having these conversations? So when I think about policymakers and um, the average Americans and, uh, and average citizens around the world, um, what would I like them to know? What would I like them to understand? I think, you know, one thing um, that now I've been working in public health for, for many, many years now, but if I reflect back upon my younger self before I really uh, you know, got, got involved in, um, in my career and um, really understood what public health is, I think that's one thing that I would like to get across to people is that, um, Public health is often um, not seen or not heard, but is vital. And um, so I think we've got the not seen and not heard part in terms <laughs> of the, the uh, community awareness, if you will. Um, but I think we need to work on the vital part and helping our community members in the United States and around the world 
to really um, understand what is it that public health is doing for them every single day, even when there's not COVID, you know, before there was COVID and at a point in time in the future when we're not in this pandemic state, um, what is it that we're doing every single day for them? Uh, and in a way that helps to make their lives better and helps to protect them and their family members. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's public health is the thing that if it's done well and we have wins and we're successful, everybody forgets what we were fighting against in the first place. Like that's actually a win, right? That nobody remembers how bad it was when polio was all over the world. and Nobody remembers a lot of these other diseases. Like those are public health victories. And then we fall victim to the victory because everybody forgets everything. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Yes. I I think it's really yeah. yeah. Doing our job well means that bad things don't happen. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, that's it. Are there any questions I haven't asked you that you really wish I did? Other things you want to say or points you want to raise? I think I'd just like to thank you um, and to thank Aifa for this opportunity. Um, we're happy to be able to have participated in the conversation series and to help people understand the importance of public health systems um, and the impact that those public health systems have on their lives, not only during COVID, but also outside of COVID. It's also important that we all continue to work together because as we talked about, we're still learning a lot from COVID. Um, we have lessons that we as public health, but also other sectors, business sectors, uh, communities um, will need to be able to apply as we as we learn uh, so that we can continue to protect ourselves and continue to protect our communities thank you so much for for making time to talk with me and and I really enjoyed this I appreciate it thank you I appreciate it as well